generation will save up to 220 terawatt per year and will translate into cost savings between 4 and 8 billion euros. Can we actually build a reliable and at the same time affordable and climate-friendly energy system? Hans Kotewek and his colleagues at Cogen Europe say yes. Actually, they've made it their mission to implement this vision in Europe. And as the organization's name suggests, the primary focus therefore is on so-called cogeneration, meaning the combined production of heat and electricity. Welcome to the Smartery Podcast, a podcast for and with the creators of the new energy world. A world in which energy will be renewable, decentralized and digital, bringing together electricity, heat and mobility. Let us show you how we will get there and who will get us there. In this episode, you will learn what we actually mean when we talk about cogeneration, the fields and industries which could benefit from this approach and its potential for Europe's economy and job market. In this episode, Hans will be our source of information. Not only does he come with more than 15 years of experience in energy environment policy, but he is currently at the helm of Cogen, the cogenerations industry joint effort to connect EU institutions and stakeholders in order to shape better policies and eliminate administrative, regulatory and market barriers to the wider use of cogeneration in Europe. Apart from that, Mr. Kurtweg, and now you have to listen carefully to be able to understand this, is a French-born Dutch-American who studied in Spain but now lives in Belgium and therefore is a perfect guest for international version of the Smartery podcast. Welcome, Hans. Happy to be here. I'm very delighted to have you here on the podcast. A very non-topical question to start with. How many languages did you end up speaking being such an international personality? Oh, I speak maybe three or four, but all very poorly. <laughs> all right. Then let's hope English is one, is one of your preferred languages. It is. So, it is. <laughs> great. Um, yeah, we always try to um, build a bridge um, for those who are not familiar with the topic and those who are already experts in it. Um, so let's start with some beginner's question first. Um, what exactly is core generation? And from a technological perspective, how does it work? Certainly. Well, I always found uh, core generation to be very beautiful and simplistic. And it's, it's really the combined generation of heat and electricity with one unit of energy. So instead of the separate unit for generating electricity and heat, you can do it with one unit, which means it will be cheaper, more efficient, and also less emissions or uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, sometimes we also call it CHP. You find CHP uh, in many different sizes, from one kilowatt to meg one megawatt. Um, in my case, in my home, in my cellar, I have a 1.7 kilowatt uh, fuel cell micro CHP unit providing me heat and electricity, electricity for my plug-in hybrid. Uh, so you find many different types of variations of the technology. You have turbines, you have engines, and as I just mentioned, fuel cells. Uh, fuel cells you mainly find in homes, but also in small and businesses. Another very good example is, at least if you're living in Northern Europe, uh, district heating. 70% of district heating actually comes from CHP. And one of the reasons why there is a higher uptake of CHP is that it's one of the most efficient ways of generating energy. And as I mentioned, you use it in industry, public buildings, district heating, if you live in the north where it's colder, and also in homes. It was originally designed for the, designed for the efficient use of fossil fuels, uh, but now we also have uh, technology uh, for the efficient use of renewable fuels, such as biomass, biogas, waste heat, and, and now more and more hydrogen and, and many different colors of hydrogen that you have. CHP is one of those technologies that can utilize those finite and probably expensive resources at the beginning in the most efficient way possible. So if I hear that it comes in all sizes, really from private homes to utilities, um, also it can be based on renewable energy, that of course sounds like a perfect tool in order to create the new energy world and get our sector coupling done. So maybe you could expand on this. What role does cogeneration play here? Well, today, cogeneration provides about 11% electricity and about 15% of heat in Europe. In 2030, we've actually extrapolated that we could double the share of electricity generation from 11% to 20% and 15% heat to 25%. And in a recent study, 
Uh, we've extrapolated that cogeneration could provide between 13 and 16 percent of electricity and between 19 and 27 percent of heat in Europe. And more than a third of the fuels already used in cogeneration today are renewable, so biomass, biogas, things like that. The figure has actually more than tripled in the past decade, really replacing solid fuels, oils, uh, things like that. And we expect to, to increase with the uptake of more renewable fuels as they become available on the market, such as biofuels and hydrogen. And we see cogeneration evolving into the backbone of what we call a decentralized and integrated energy system, where energy will be generated and consumed at a local level or a distributed level. It's connected to the gas grid, but it's also connected to the electricity grid and the heating networks in Europe. So it has a keen role to play in tying all those different uh, energy vectors. Uh, it can provide electricity and heat when and where needed. Uh, and this will accelerate the uptake of more wind and solar power as cogeneration will ensure that there is sufficient energy when there is not enough wind and sun. And cogeneration can accelerate the uptake of electrified solutions such as heat pumps, electrical vehicles, as cogeneration makes uh, sure there is enough electricity to feed them. The more electrification, the more higher uh, the need for cogeneration in our view. And in a decentralized system, cogeneration systems will generate electricity locally, uh, and this will avoid the need for more transmission and distribution lines to bring electricity across the country. And that, of course, will also lead to a loss of energy. So, probably in my own words, it really does have a key role to play in the sector coupling and the new energy world. I think we're already ready to start in with the more sophisticated questions. But before we do that, a quick shout out to our partner for this episode, which is Siemens. Siemens is addressing the global climate change with sustainable energy and performance solutions, which allow consumers, municipalities and industries to act energy efficient, integrate more renewables and contribute to decarbonization. So Hans, let's pick it up again. Actually, together with Artelis, you have had a cooperation and published a report called Towards an Efficient, Integrated and Cost-Effective Net Zero Energy System in 2050, the role of cogeneration. What are the key findings here that you came up with? And maybe also what key findings did surprise you even as an expert on the topic? Uh, well, we're very proud of this. This uh, was a lot of work that we put together with our members and different partners uh, together with Artelis to, to model and extrapolate the, the role of uh, CHP in 2050. Of course, it's in a way, it's a bit of a looking into a crystal ball. We can't predict what will happen in 20, 30 years, but we can certainly try to be as accurate as possible based on what we know today. So, as you mentioned, the study was carried out by Artelis to calculate the benefits of energy efficiency and uh, system integration via cogeneration in a climate neutral system in 2050. This is what the premise is uh, in Europe. We want to be carbon neutral by 2050. This is the political aspiration, at least. Cogeneration is ready for a full, fully climate neutral system. Cogeneration brings the multiple benefits, uh, both to the entire system, but also to the end user. It's one of the few technologies that really focuses and empowers the end users. Uh, and this is businesses, local communities, families, but also industry in 2050. And thanks to being efficient, cogeneration will use reduce the use of renewable fuels. Hence, it will also reduce the energy bills for end users. So on, on average, looking towards 2050, cogeneration will save up to 220 terawatt per year and will translate into cost savings between 4 and 8 billion euros. So more precisely, so an average European family can save around 800 euros per year by installing uh, in their house a cogeneration system running on hydrogen and fuel cells. I mean, that's one of the things that attracted me to the technology when, when I invested myself in, in a fuel cell micro CHP unit. The energy savings, but uh, the environmental benefits, but also, you know, financially, also very interesting. And when you say invested, you mean invested into a cogeneration um, system in your own private house? In my own private house, yes. I looked at the, the economics of it, but I also looked at the environmental uh, aspects as well as the, the empowerment as a user. And, and this, this applies from one kilowatt to, to one megawatt. So I'm a private consumer, but also this applies to large European industries uh, who can have their own cogeneration unit on site 
producing uh, the electricity uh, and heat that they need for whatever industrial processes. And that also creates resiliency as well uh, in the future. And in the case of large European industries, they can save up to 10 million euros annually just by switching to cogeneration. Because cogeneration connects to gas grids, the electricity grid and heating network, it brings more reliability and flexibility to the energy system as it generates heat and electricity when it's needed. And if fossil fuels are still used in 2015, it'd probably be very limited, but cogeneration will then continue to reduce those CO2 emissions uh, in the most efficient way possible. Well, one or the other fact that maybe you didn't see coming uh, in the report. When, when we started this process, we, we, we knew a lot about what was happening um, on the industrial side, uh, because we, we represent a lot of uh, utilities, ESCOs, uh, end users. And so we had a lot of that information already. But what was interesting was to find out what really happens uh, at a consumer level. So households and small and medium enterprises, public buildings and things like that. And even there, the use of cogeneration was positive in 2050 when when you're operating in a, a net zero carbon system. So these technologies are relying on you know green fuels and uh, hydrogen biofuels and things like that. And uh, it was quite a surprise to see it's still contributing and then benefiting local consumers from from an economics perspective, not just the environmental side. So that was that was a, a nice surprise from our side. Mm -hmm. Did that also maybe shift your perception of uh, where cogeneration will be particularly important? Uh, not, not necessarily, uh, because you can have cogeneration in, in all size, sizes and shapes. Uh, as well as different technologies, I think there there is something a little bit of something for everybody. I mentioned uh, you have gas turbines, but you also have engines, and those come also in in small sizes as well. So it can be also applicable to to homes, not just uh, fuel cells. And those technologies uh, will continue to work between today and 2050 because they have uh, the ability to switch fuels and. Uh, With R&D and innovation, that'll happen much faster. And so, you know, you invest in today, you still have something that, that will, is ready for the future, in effect. You know, you've heard of HD-ready TVs. Well, cogeneration is, is the same in that respect in terms of future fuels. Ah, that was a very nice image you threw in there, the um, HD TV or the 4K TV uh, for energy production. So where do you see the most, uh, the highest growth rates in all of these areas? Well, cu currently we see the highest growth in, in small-scale cogeneration uh, applications such as uh, cogeneration installed in, in small and medium enterprises, uh, public buildings such as hospitals and schools, uh, also home systems uh, as the example of the, the fuel cell system uh, we have at home now. And you, you find especially small and medium enterprises, uh, they build up on a modular approach. So instead of having one very large device, uh, they will have, you know, uh, a stack of 10 different uh, fuel cells, fuel cell micro CHPs running, which can provide them more flexibility as well and also uh, reduce the, the capex. Actually, I find myself repeating a little bit in each episode we do because it just so happens that in almost every episode I also start talking about hydrogen. But I think it is just such a relevant topic at the moment. And you've already also talked about hydrogen in the context of cogen. So how do you see its potential for use in cogeneration? And are most cogeneration producers or their machines currently ready for 100% hydrogen? That's a, that's a very good question. Like you mentioned, hydrogen is, is sort of on the tip of everyone's lips, uh, at least in Brussels. Uh, well, first I should state that cogeneration is, is fuel agnostic. You, you can run it on anything you have. Obviously, today we have a, a different mix than what we will predict in the future. But already today, we have the technology systems in place that will allow engines and turbines to run on hydrogen. Of course, there's not enough hydrogen probably today to continuously run them on hydrogen. But they're also designed in such a way where they can be tweaked Uh, without too much expense to, to run on different levels uh, of hydrogen blended with methane, CH4, or natural gas as we know it today. But in the future, engines and, and gas turbines will be able to, to run on hydrogen 
or whatever mix of fuel that we have available uh, in the future. In terms of fuel cell micro CHP, today they run on natural gas. So they take that natural gas, they have reformers inside these little kits. I mean, it's in the case of mine, it's, it's the size of a dishwasher, not very big. That natural gas is reformed into hydrogen and then that hydrogen is fed through the fuel cell. Uh, in the future, these things will be able to run on biogas uh, with a few changes, but they can also switch to use pure hydrogen. Uh, you take the reformer out, you don't need the natural gas and you run just on pure hydrogen. And they also have the potential to be reversible. So uh, when you need more hydrogen, you can produce your own hydrogen and then use it. So it's, it's quite a lot of different things. It's quite a versatile technology. Uh, we already have really interesting examples of the use of hydrogen in Europe. We have one member, I won't mention the particular company's name, but in the north of Germany, they're working together with a local municipality where they have an engine on site. Uh, the municipality uses a lot of wind and, and solar. Uh, when there's too much wind and solar, and that's curtailed, that electricity is then used to produce hydrogen and that hydrogen is stored. And when that wind and solar isn't producing the necessary amounts of electricity, they will run that engine on that hydrogen to produce the electricity they need, but also heat for district heating purposes. So there's already really interesting examples in Europe today. That is a really brilliant example. And since we're already talking um, on a manufacturer level now, I'll give you a combined question with different aspects. And that is, what potential do you see for this technology you specifically talked about to be rolled out in large scale? And what kind of job potential do you think will go hand in hand with this here in Europe for local manufacturers? Well, there's already a strong uh, manufacturing base uh, in Europe. Most of the, the, the companies uh, that are involved in cogeneration happen to come from Europe. You, you mentioned Siemens, and they're obviously involved in cogeneration, but other, other companies as well, uh, from, from very small to very big. Uh, so there is a very strong uh, industrial base and know-how in Europe, and we want to, to maintain that, of course. Will the European Green Deal come handy <laughs> in this regard? Uh, definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, in terms of our extrapolations of the potential for CHP, it's, it's based on sound policy. So today we have 11% electricity and 25%, uh, sorry, 15% heat. But with the right policies in place and the right incentives in place, already in 2030, you can see a doubling of electricity production in Europe and uh, going from 15 to 25% by 2030 in Europe. And just uh, just last week, uh, the EU leaders agreed to uh, further increase the, the, the CO2 reduction target for Europe, uh, and that will have a, a cascading effect on other EU legislation that's being discussed now uh, in the context of the, the European Green Deal, and specifically things like the, the Energy Efficiency Directive. Unfortunately, one of the things it's not talked about enough, perhaps in Europe, is the importance of energy efficiency. It's perhaps overused term but not really implemented and and what i mean by that is if you everyone has heard of the 20 targets uh, for energy efficiency renewables and uh, co2 reduction so uh, the only one that we haven't met is actually the energy efficiency uh, target and, and that's because uh, there isn't a strong uh, take up of more efficient technologies there's a strong focus on final energy savings in europe which is, you know, talking about buildings, insulation, LED lights, all that fun stuff. But that's only part of the, the whole picture. We have to look at the whole value chain. Uh, and uh, generation side efficiency is also important. And that's what we're talking about, primary energy savings. So there's, there's a lot of potential still, but we need the right policies in place. And that's what we're looking for in the, the European Green Deal in terms of recognizing cogeneration CHP to help the EU reach the existing targets and the ones that will most likely be uh, amended in order to, to meet the new climate targets for 2030. When I listen to you, it just sounds like such an obvious idea to combine um, heat and power production. And it's quite brilliant to hear that um, the technology is pretty advanced and uh, ready to be rolled out or already is being rolled out. So how are other regions in the world looking at that? I know like you have the focus on Europe with the work of CoGen, but what do you see other regions doing around the world? Is it an idea that's catching on fast? Is it implemented already in other regions? I, I know about Japan and I know specifically about fuel cells. Uh, there's a massive uptake of fuel cell micro CHP in Japan. 
Uh, and that's because it's a, it's a country that is, well, it's an island. It doesn't have its own natural resources. It was heavily reliant on, on nuclear power. They've had to import a lot of gas. And, and this is one of the most efficient ways to use gas in individual dwellings. And so you have millions and millions of fuel cell micro CHP units already in Japan. But on an industrial level, you do also see a lot of CHP being used as well as dislocating in Japan, uh, in Korea. And then, of course, if you pivot to the other side of the world, uh, you see a lot of CHP uh, being used in, in Central America, Mexico, but also uh, in South America. The US is, is also a country that's very much interested in CHP, uh, especially now you have very cheap gas. And so, you know, today, uh, natural gas, at least in Europe, represents about 40% of the, the fuel use. And in the U.S., it's probably much higher. And that's because you have a very interesting spark spread, meaning electricity is probably quite expensive. The gas is very cheap. And when you have that, that spread, it be, makes CHP even more competitive uh, from an economic perspective, not just also taking into account the, the environmental uh, side of things. So the U.S. is also moving forward with promoting uh, CHP. Thank you for joining us today, Hans, and uh, providing us with these brilliant insights. It's my pleasure. It, was, uh, it got me excited again, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to hear. And um, having heard that, let me try uh, myself at a spontaneous conclusion of our talk. Um, it's an interesting technology um, looking at also the job potential. There are already a lot of jobs in Europe um, invested in cogeneration. And as we heard, um, there will be a global market of sorts. Also, the potential in regards to energy savings and resource savings in Europe is huge. Um, I think it was interesting that you mentioned that it really could help reduce the use of primary energy resources. So to be more efficient uh, when you look at the primary energy source here. And um, it's quite interesting to see that it's really relevant uh, for small and large players alike. So for people such as you using it in your private home to maybe um, players in the middle, such as universities running their facilities and their buildings up to larger players such as industry, factories um, or even utilities. So it is an interesting topic and it's also brilliant to see that um, with this topic actually Brussels is already a couple of steps ahead and is um, working on the proper regulations. I may add, actually, there, there, there are uh, many other more interesting uh, examples. Football stadiums around Europe use CHP. A lot of water is needed. Uh, believe it or not, most of the EU buildings in Brussels uh, use CHP, the European Commission headquarters, uh, the European Parliament, it, even the building where Council of Ministers meet, the European Council of Ministers. So everyone's using it. So everyone's using it. And what's really exciting is it's not only a technology of tomorrow, but it's already working in the here and now. Thanks for joining us, Hans. Hey, it was a pleasure. Hope to do it again. Stay tuned for more episodes of the Smart EE podcast. You will find everything about cool generation and much more at EM Power Europe, the international exhibition for energy management and integrated energy solutions. From June 9th to 11th in 2021. Check out the website on em-power.eu.